Good morning and welcome to this service for Christchurch on Sunday the 7th of February. You're very welcome as you join us this week from your own home, whether on YouTube or on DVD. It's good that we're all able to, to join together in these services of worship, to come together as a church at this time, to look to God, to worship him and to seek his help in all that we are facing. Uh, we're looking today about the relationship between faith and how we live, how that has worked out in our lives. And Hebrews chapter 11 begins by saying, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And then Hebrews chapter 11 goes on to speak about a number of people and how they acted in response to the faith that they placed in God. And we are going to sing now about that in our opening praise today as we sing together by faith. together. Lord God, we thank you that we come today to a God who is faithful. As we come to you, our Heavenly Father, and as we come to worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we know that you are faithful in all your ways. You're entirely dependable. And so for us to put our trust and to put our faith in you is the right and the natural thing to do. It gives us such confidence such assurance both for now and for all that lies ahead. Lord, help us as we seek to put our trust in you. 
at times when we have doubts and questions. Lord, help us with them. We thank you that you meet us at wherever we are and you're there to help us on. And to you who is truly faithful, Lord, we come to you. We want to put our faith in you and we want to see that faith worked out in every area of our lives. Lord, we thank you for the many examples of faith that we have here within Hebrews chapter 11. And we'll be thinking about a couple of those as we go on through our service today. Lord, we know that these people were not perfect, but the God in whom they trusted, well, you, you are perfect in all your ways. You welcomed them, you helped them. And as they stepped out in faith to live for you, you gave them strength and were there with them. So Lord, for us today, help us to understand more about what it means to live by faith, to live with our trust in you, and to put that into practice in every area of our lives. So Lord, help us not only today to understand these things better, but to be prepared and open and willing to put all of this into action within our lives. So guide us by your spirit to give us wisdom, to give us strength and the desire to live more and more for you. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from James chapter 2. We're continuing over these weeks in our studies in the book of James. And today we're looking at the second half of James chapter 2. Our reading begins at, at verse 14. This is God's word. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodgings to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Now a time especially for, for the boys and girls, but uh, for us all and what we're thinking about today. Um, there's a few pictures that are going to appear up just down on the corner of, of the screen uh, below me. The things that, that go together, and in each of these, one of them is covered up. And I'll give you a second for each to see if you can guess what it is. Um, so the first picture is there for you. If you can see just at the bottom of the screen, there are some chips there. So it's not hard for us to work out that what will be resting on top of those chips. Well, it's fish. And um, the two of those go well together from the chippy. We like to get fish and chips. Maybe you prefer sausages or chicken nuggets or something else like that. Um, but these things go together, together well uh, with, with chips. Now, the next time, there's two guys here um, up on the screen. Well, there's one of them you can see. One of them is covered up. The one that you can see, I think, is Ant. And the one who is with him, well, you've worked it out by now that that is Deck and um, that is there behind. And the two of them, we always see them together on the TV, the same way round, always pitched together as they come on, presenting the programs and whatever they're doing, Ant and Deck, so often always together and presenting on the TV. The next one, well, we have a nice mug of hot chocolate there being poured out. Now, what do you think is missing? What needs to go along with that um, to complete it? Well, what we have on the other side of the screen is some marshmallows. Maybe that's what you were thinking about, or maybe you were thinking about a flake, or maybe you're thinking about some uh, cream or something to go on the top of that. Any of those are good answers, but hot chocolate and marshmallows go very well together. Uh, the next one you'll recognize as Mr. Bean. 
And um, for the younger ones watching, you're maybe used to the cartoon as it is here on the screen. Um, or for a wee bit older, you're maybe used to the program with the, the actor in it um, that was on years ago. The same story running um, through both of those. And so Mr. Bean driving along in his car. Who do you think is in beside Mr. Bean? Well, it's Teddy. And there he is. Um, got a seatbelt on, keeping him nice and safe. And they're riding along in the car alongside Mr. Bean. The last one that we have... We have a football team there, that is Liverpool Football Club, of course. And what is it that's blanked over? What is it that goes well together uh, with Liverpool? Uh, well, that is the, the Premiership Trophy, uh, which they won for the first time in the Premiership, as it is um, last year. And that goes well with Liverpool. And, well, I don't know too much whether that will come to them again this year, but we'll see what happens over the next few months. And I'll mention a wee bit more um, about Liverpool later on, later on today. So these things sometimes are double acts or things that, that we're used to seeing together or that we like to see together and one without the other, well, it, it isn't quite the same. There's something missing if one of these things is not there and in place. In our Bible reading that we read just a few minutes ago from the book of James, there James talks about two things going together and there's two words that he uses and he puts the two of these together and those two words are faith and deeds. Now, these are maybe words that we don't use all that often, but they're two words that James uses, and he says that they're important for us to know both of these words and for both of these words to be part of our lives. And they're a little bit simpler than maybe the words that when we see them that we're not quite sure about. The first of these words is, is faith. And faith is believing in God, but not just believing that God exists. It is putting our trust in God, trusting in Jesus to forgive our sins and asking him to lead us on to be in charge of our lives and to lead us on through life. That's what faith is, believing in God, putting our, our trust in him, putting him first in our lives and saying that we belong to him. That's all of what comes under that word of, of faith, our belief and our trust in God. Then the other word, deeds, it's a word probably that you don't use all that often, but it's the word that, that James uses here in our Bibles that we have. And this is about our life. It's about the things that we do, the things that, that we say. So not just about the things we, that we believe, but the things that we do, the things that we think, the things that we say. All of these are the deeds, the actions, the things that fill up our days, the, what we spend our days doing. Well, that's what James is talking about when he says about our deeds. And James tells us that it's important that we have both of these in the right way. That we have faith in God, that we put our trust in him. And then that our deeds, our, our life shows that out. It shows that we belong to God and that we obey the things that God has told us to do. And we live in the way that God wants us to live. And James tells us that these two things, it's important in our lives that both of these things go together. Another way that we could think about it is like the wings on a bird. You see a bird flying through the sky and their wings are maybe flapping to get them going or maybe their wings are just being held out as they soar through the sky and they're able to fly by keeping their wings out and in place. Now imagine that a bird had been injured. Imagine that one of its wings had been broken or had been damaged and the other wing was just holding out and was doing well. Do you think that bird would be able to fly? Well, do you think, well, if the bird has one wing, it can fly half as well as it could fly if it had two wings. Well, that's not the case at all. If a bird only had one wing and the other wing was broken off or was damaged, the bird wouldn't be able to fly at all. The bird needs both wings to be able to fly. And it's only with both wings in place that the bird is able to flap its wings and go or to soar very majestically through the sky with both wings in place. And that's the same idea of what James is saying to us. We can't just say, I believe in God and I trust in him and then live however we want. Nor can we say, well, I'm trying to live a good life, but I don't really want the part of believing in God. And James says we need both of these. We need to believe in God, to put our trust in him, to ask him to forgive us, to help us. And then we need to live a life that pleases him. Because what James is telling us is we can't go around saying, well, I believe in God. I'm a Christian. I'm trusting in God. And then be telling lies to people. Or we can't be saying, well, yes, I really am very important to me that I'm a Christian and then we're not kind to people. We're saying one thing and doing another thing. It, it doesn't match. It doesn't fit together. It doesn't work. And that's all of what James is talking to us about. And we'll talk more about this later on. You can all stay watching and what we're saying more about this later on when James talks to us all to say to us 
about what we say and what we believe and what we think about God and our trust in him. It's very important. And as well as that, how we live, how we show that out in our lives. Both of these things are very important. We don't always get it perfect. We don't always do everything right. But we can ask God and he will forgive us for the times when we don't live and do everything as we should. And he will give us strength to do differently and to do better in the future when we ask him to do that. So let's take a moment now to talk to God about these things. Dear God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you call us to to follow you, to know you, to put our trust in you. We thank you for all the love that you have shown to us and especially for how you have sent Jesus to come to be our saviour and to bring forgiveness for all the things that we have done wrong. Lord, help us to put our faith in you, to trust in you as the one who can forgive us, as the one who will lead us, as the one who has everything that is best for us. Help us to trust in you and to put our faith in you. And help us as well to live that out in our lives, to live in a way that that pleases you in everything that we say, in all that we do. Lord, we pray that we might know your help in everything. Lord, we ask that you'll be with us through these difficult days that we face. With things that we are finding hard, may we know your help and your care. And all of these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to to sing it again now together. Our next song is Be Bold, Be Strong, reminding us that wherever we go, whatever we do, that the Lord our God is with us. Let's sing together. Be bold, be strong. announcements to mention at this time. Uh, On Wednesday evening, we were meeting together for prayer, meeting online using the Zoom app. That's on Wednesday evening at 7.45. You can join in through your your computer, your phone, your tablet, and whatever it may be, you can join in with that. And if I can help you in any way of getting on with that, um, then please get in touch. So one, one meeting just this week all together, Wednesday evening for a Bible reflection and for prayer at 7.45. And everyone is very welcome to join in with that. Then next Sunday, we're planning to have Messy Church. Um, Again, that will be online using Zoom. It will be at four o'clock next Sunday afternoon. And if you'd like to join in with that, any of our younger families are very welcome to join in. Or if there's anybody else you know would appreciate being part of that, then please let them know and they can join in with that as well. If you get in touch with me to let me know that you'll be part of that, then we'll get a wee goodie bag to you before next weekend and with some things that will help you to be part of Messy Church next Sunday at four o'clock. As we continue on through this month of February, our services uh, will just be online and we're not able to meet again until March at at the earliest. Um, So our services each week through the rest of February will be online on on YouTube and on DVDs. Also, just to mention that if you have any stamps, maybe you have more letters coming in and there's stamps there, um, you can collect those, you can hold on to them. And then when we're back to church, um, Derek Hunter is still collecting those and he'll be glad um, to receive your stamps And when we're able to get back to church, hopefully in a few weeks' time. So you can just gather those up at home and then bring them along with you uh, when you're coming. And as I say, at each week through this time, if there's anything that I can help you with, if there's anything that you need, whether you want to chat or there's some practical help that you need or something you'd like me to to pray with you for, um, then please get in touch at any time 
Phone number is there on the screen, email address is there. There's that and other means that you can get in touch. Um, so please do feel free to contact me um, for any reason uh, at any time. And I'll very gladly um, speak to you and help you, help you in any way uh, that I can. So we come now to God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we can come to you, putting our faith and our, our trust in you. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness towards us. And Lord, we thank you in every way that we can draw near to you. And Lord, we want, as we come to you at this time, to think of those who are facing particular needs at this time. And Lord, we think of, of people who have been bereaved within recent days and weeks and the challenge that that brings to them as they face the loss of a loved one. Lord, we ask that they will know your comfort and your strength. Lord, we pray for, for people who've been bereaved maybe months ago, maybe even years ago, and for whom this time is particularly difficult. Lord, help them to know your comfort and your care. Lord, we pray for others who are facing illness at this time. Lord, people may be directly affected by coronavirus and people facing other health issues, whether in hospital, in, in nursing homes, or in their own homes. Lord, we pray that your strength and your help might be known. And Lord, we want to take a moment or two now within the stillness to bring our own prayers and requests to you, whether for issues that people have in relation to their health or other th challenging things that they're facing within life. We want to take a moment or two now just within the stillness to bring our own requests and prayers to you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, we know that these times that we are going through are bringing many and different challenges, affecting us, each of us in different ways at different times. And for those who are struggling, particularly at present, Lord, we ask that your presence and your care may be known in a real way, that your comfort would bring a real strength and help to face the days that, that lie ahead. And Lord, where people are particularly struggling in whatever sense, Lord, we ask that help might be known, that there may be people that, that they can speak to to find practical help, encouragement, and, and, and all that they need. Lord, we thank you for the ongoing work of the vaccines and the ever-increasing number of people who have received that. And we pray that that would be effective, and we pray that you'll continue to guide the rollout of that and all that is going on. And Lord, within and just this last number of days and building over the last few weeks, we've seen different and tensions and unease within our, our community and across our society. And Lord, we pray that just for all the issues that are, that are behind us, Lord, we pray that there may be peace. We pray that things may, may settle down. And we pray that there wouldn't be growing um, reactions to things that, that, that are happening. Lord, we pray for a real sense of peace. We pray for wisdom. We pray for your protection across our, our police. We thank you for those who work sometimes in danger of their own lives, to, to keep us safe and for all that they do. We ask that you'll protect them. And at every level through policing and, and government, Lord, we ask for, for good working forward in complex and difficult situations. So Lord, we thank you across all of these things that you're with us. And we pray that in every sense that your care and your help might be known. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was younger, I had a mug that said on it, world's greatest Liverpool fan. Now, it was bought to me as a joke. I referred to Liverpool earlier on in the service. And if I had to uh, name a football team that I support, Liverpool would be the, the, na the, the name and the answer that I would give. Um, but the truth is that I'm not really that interested in football. I know that comes to, to, as a disappointment that some people will be into football and will know I'm, I'm not really. Um, and if someone was to see me years ago with that mug, world's greatest Liverpool fan, if they were to see me with that mug and they didn't really know me, they might start to ask a few questions to strike up a conversation. Oh, did you see the match at the weekend? What do you think about so-and-so, a player, a transfer, whatever all is going on? How often are you able to get over um, to Anfield to watch Liverpool playing there? And I very soon realise by my answers or lack of answers to these questions that the mug is a lie. 
that I'm not actually the world's greatest Liverpool fan. And it can be easy to claim something with our words. It can be easy to say something, to have it on a mug or a t-shirt or wherever it may be, or words that we speak, things that we say. It can be easy to say that, but for it to mean anything, for those words actually to have value, it has to be backed up by our actions. And that's what this second half of James chapter 2 is all about. James opens up this section by laying things out in very clear terms. He says in verse 14, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Or putting it another way, what good is it to say that you are a Christian but to show no evidence of it in your life? So that's what what James is getting at here about that claim for us of being Christians, of having faith, but not showing that and displaying it across our lives. And so to help us to understand what James lays out here in verse 14, he works through four different examples through the rest of this passage, taking us up to the end of chapter 2. Running through four examples, we're going to look at each of them today. The first are two examples of how not to do it, And then he gives two better examples from the Old Testament of people who exercised their faith in God and worked that out well within their lives. So the first example that James gives us here, it comes in verses 15 to to 17. And there James is showing us faith without action. And James's description of that is that faith without action is dead. And so here in verse 15, James sets the scene. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. So he's saying to them, imagine there's someone within your church who doesn't have the basic things that they need. They don't have clothes to wear. They don't have food to eat. There are those basic needs that they don't have. Now, our responsibility to care for others goes beyond our church fellowship and our church family. But the particular example here is within the church. So you're looking across the church. You're thinking, well, there's somebody. They haven't clothes. They've got holes in their shoes. They're not going home to a nice dinner. And the person then, the other person in the church who responds to them in verse 16 says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed. They just give them a little greeting, a few words to speak to them, to wish them well. And James rightly asks, What good is that? Wishing somebody well who has holes in their shoes, their clothes, who doesn't have food to eat, just simply wishing them well, what does that do for the person in need? How does it help them? Well, quite simply, it doesn't help them. And at the end of this section in verse 17, James gives that that summary where he says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Jesus says a similar thing in Matthew chapter 7 when he says there, by your fruit you will know them. By every good tree, Jesus says, every good tree bears good fruit. And so Jesus is saying there that by our lives and by our actions, if someone is a genuine believer and their faith is genuine, well, that will show out in their lives. Now, this doesn't mean that we will be perfect, that we will get it right every time, that we'll do everything that we possibly can but there will be some signs within our lives. And if someone claims to be a Christian, but their life is very far from it, and in every aspect of their life, the way they're living it is not consistent with that claim to be a Christian, it even goes right to the foundation of that claim and brings it into question. So as we think about this, about faith being shown in deeds and the importance of our faith being worked out in action, the place for us to start with this is in looking at ourselves. It's for each of us to ask, what evidence is there to the people around me that I am a Christian? So people may know that I have things that I, I believe, they may know that I go to church, but, but, but what else is there to show people that I'm a Christian? And there's plenty, I'm sure, for each of us to think about in that question. What is there to show other people? In what ways do I behave differently? Do I act differently? In what ways is that shown out in my life that I am a Christian? And we should think about that and take that seriously for ourselves. Then when it comes to other people, we need to be careful not to judge them. It is God alone who knows people's hearts. But there can be a place when we're thinking about other people for us sensitively and carefully 
to say to someone, if someone is claiming to be a Christian but living a life in many aspects that's very different from that, to ask them, is that way of living, are those choices that you're making, is that in keeping with your faith? Is that a good way to live? And this is part of our role of fellowship and care for each other within the church to do that. Now, it's not easy. We need to be careful in doing that and to be sensitive. But there's times maybe we do need to approach things with people. But as I've said already, before we think about speaking to anybody or raising anything with anybody else, there's more than enough to be getting on with within ourselves and thinking, how is it evident to others that I am a Christian? The things that I believe, how are they being shown within my life? Because as James warns us very clearly here, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So that's the first example and the first little section that, that James takes us through. The next part then comes in verses 18 to 20, where James wants to show us the difference between simply believing that God exists, the difference between that and real saving faith. Now, within this, there's a, there's a conversation going on in verse 18 where, where someone's saying, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. I will show you faith by my deeds, James says to them. And all of this conversation about, well, faith and deeds, and how, how does this all, does this all work out? And James then goes on to, get, to raise the importance of our faith being rightly rooted. And so it goes on then into verse 19, where some, James says to them, you believe that there is one God. That is good. But James continues on from that by effectively saying to them, well, you believe there is one God, that's good. Do you know who else believes that there is one God? Well, the demons believe that. The demons believe there is one God and they shudder at the thought of it. So what James is saying here is that simply believing that there is a God is not enough. And so that's for us. If you're thinking, and maybe you're watching this saying, is there a God? Well, yes, there, there probably is. Your census form will come out in a month or two's time and we'll ask you some questions. And there might be a question in that, do you believe there is a God? Well, if I was asked, do you believe there's a God? I would tick that box. And what James is saying is that it's not enough for us simply to tick a box saying, I believe that there is a God. We need to go far, far beyond that. All that that does is to put you on a level with the devil by saying that you believe in God. It's a good start, James says, but it's not enough. And as you read in other parts of the New Testament, Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so this real saving faith is more than just some mental acknowledgement that there is a God. It's actually believing in our heart. It's placing our trust wholly and completely in him. It's more than just ticking a box to say that you agree with something. It's believing in your heart the truth of the gospel. It's declaring with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he is in charge. And so faith, this real saving faith, it's a real commitment to Jesus Christ. And it's by that faith that we are saved. And what James is taking us on then to see here within this chapter is that when we have that faith, when our, our trust is wholeheartedly put in Jesus Christ, when we're believing in our heart in him and declaring with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, that that then will be worked out into action within our lives in many other ways. If we don't have the first part, if the faith is not rightly in place and we don't have that commitment to Jesus Christ in response to the grace that he shows to and offers to us, if we don't have that commitment to him, will our action and change in our lives will not truly happen. The action won't be sustained because the heart change is not going on within us. And so we need that first part in place of our faith to be rightly set in Jesus. But then on the other side of this, if the action doesn't follow, if we say that we trust in Jesus, but no change is evident in our lives, then it really brings into question whether we have made that true commitment to Jesus. And so from the first of these examples, we see that we shouldn't say that we have faith and then do nothing about it. So we shouldn't claim to have faith and then have no actions is the first example here. 
And then here we see that we shouldn't just say, well, I believe in God in some vague sense, believing that God exists, where James tells us, well, that only puts us in line with the demons. We actually need to put our trust in Jesus, to have that saving faith in him, faith which will then be shown by seeking to live for him in every part of our lives. So those are two, two wrong examples to begin with of faith and how that can, can be wrongly handled and dealt with. James then moves on to two more positive examples, picking up on two characters from the Old Testament who are quite different um, in who they are. The first of these that James mentions is Abraham, uh, which comes in verses 21 to 24 here within our passage. And Abraham is described within this as a friend of God. And as James talks about Abraham here, he picks up on two chapters from the book of Genesis that gives us the account of Abraham's life. Here in verse, verse 23 of our reading from James chapter 2, there's a direct quote from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, which says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. In that passage in Genesis chapter 15, just before that, God has told Abraham that he is going to have a son. And the problem with that was that Abraham was an old man. He had no children at that stage and his wife wasn't far behind him in terms of her age. And so God had promised something to Abraham that in every sense seemed impossible. But still Abraham believed in him. That was his faith being shown there as Abraham believed what God told him. He put his trust in God. And what we're told here then about what it says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to, credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham put his faith in God, trusting in what God had told him. And then he was received by God and welcomed by God on the basis of his faith. And then we're told at the end of verse 23, it says about Abraham, and he was called God's friend. All of this came about because he put his trust in God. But how do we know that that trust actually meant anything? How do we know that that faith, that some, some substance, some, some meaning that Abraham really trusted God? Well, the greatest example comes in Genesis chapter 22. There God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son. So in the years in between, Abraham has miraculously had a son to his wife, Sarah, and that son that God had promised to him, the son is born. And then God, in what seems like a very strange thing to say to Abraham, tells Abraham to take his son and to sacrifice him. And such was Abraham's faith in God that he was willing to do it. He knew that God was going to work away, that God was going to do something again, and he trusted in God and went along with what God said. And so here it says in verse 22, here in James chapter 2, where James says, you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. So for Abraham, his faith, what he believed and what he knew to be true about God and his trust in God was then worked out in, in his actions. It was shown by his actions, the two of those worked together. And as James says, his faith was made complete by what he did. So for Abraham to sit at home in a comfortable armchair and say, well, yes, I believe and I trust in God was all very well. But that faith was demonstrated and shown by being obedient to God and by doing what God had instructed him to do. That was the true demonstration of that faith. And as Abraham went through his life, this faith which underlay it all, this faith and trust in God was shown. Now, that didn't always happen. There were some significant moments when Abraham got it wrong, when he did the very opposite of what God had told him to do. He didn't act in line with his faith. There are a few big incidents of that, and I'm sure many other small ones that aren't recorded for us in the Bible. But the general path for Abraham was to live out the faith in God that he declared. So that was what he did. That was how he chose to live, to live in accordance with the faith in God that he had. Such a contrast between the demons who simply believe that God exists. Real contrast that we see here, as James talked about this before, back up in verse 19, he talked about the demons who simply believe that God exists, 
and they shudder in fear at the thought of him. What a contrast between that and Abraham, the one who puts his faith in God and is welcomed by God as a friend. So the demons believe that a God exists and shudder in fear at his thought. Abraham knows God personally, having put his trust in him, living out that trust, and God is pleased to call Abraham his friend. What a contrast. And if you are a Christian, God not only calls Abraham his friend, he also calls you his friend as well. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you know him as your saviour, well, God calls you his friend is, as well. Jesus says this in, in John chapter 15, verse 15. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. And so for us today, with our faith in Christ, he is pleased to call us his friends. So that, that's Abraham, and we see just a little bit about how Abraham's faith was worked out in his life there. James then takes us on at the end of this section to his final example of Rahab, who again is showing faith in action. Now, Rahab was quite different from Abraham. Abraham, of course, was male. Rahab was female. And so in, in a very male-dominated society, James chooses an example alongside Abraham of someone who is female. As well as that, she was Gentile. She wasn't Jewish by her background in the way that Abraham was. She was a foreigner from another nation and not from, from, from God's own people. And Rahab wasn't exactly the most respected within society. As Abraham, who is held up as one of the great pillars and, and fathers of the faith, well, Rahab wasn't quite in that view within her own society. But here she is held up as a co-example alongside Abraham. So here we have Abraham and Rahab, the two people who are being held up together as examples of faith being lived out. And for Rahab, that is the case because it is explained here of how she assisted the spies in the land of Canaan. Rahab had come to hear of their God and she put her trust in him as she heard about him. And that faith in God was then put into action in assisting God, God's servants. And all of this goes to show, as we see the example of Rahab being held up here, it goes to show that it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what has gone on before in your life. God welcomes all who genuinely put their faith in him. All who come in repentance and faith are welcomed by him. And as I mentioned last week, all that we need to do in approaching God is to hold out our empty hands. And that's what faith is, holding out our empty hands to God, telling him that we have nothing to offer but our sin, and then receiving in faith all that he has for him by his grace and by his mercy. That's what faith is, holding that out to God. And then as we do that, as we receive his mercy, as we receive his forgiveness and, and all that he has for us, if that really means something to us, if we really mean it when we ask for his forgiveness, when we ask for his leading in life, if we really mean it, then change will come in our lives. We will desire to live differently. As I've mentioned already, we don't get it all right every time and that's the ongoing struggle within our lives as Christians. But there is a desire to live differently and it troubles us when we don't live as we should. All of that is evidence that our faith is real, that that faith is genuine, that it means something, that that faith is leading to action and change within our lives. And so as we finish today, we hold together these two words of faith and deeds that James sets beside each other, remembering that faith is the basis of our relationship with God that we are saved by grace through faith that comes entirely because of what God has done for us and what Jesus did for us upon the cross. That is the basis of our whole relationship with God. But that faith is then shown to be genuine and real. It's shown to mean something as it brings about change and is seen in action and an ongoing development within our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, help us today as we seek to hold these things together, to think about what it means to have faith in you, 
to wholeheartedly trust in you with every part of our lives. And help us as we think of how we hold that together with change in our lives. Lord, help us not to be um, claiming one thing, to be saying one thing about us, and then living in a way that completely contradicts that. Lord, we pray that by your grace and by your spirit that you would point out to us aspects of our life where we're falling short, where we're not living as we should, and give us an openness to hear that and to respond to it. We thank you for your grace, which is sufficient for every sin in our lives. And Lord, help us then to want to live that out more and more, to show by our deeds the faith that we have, the one who we love, the one who first loved us. Lord, help us as we wrestle with these things to understand it and to see that all put into practice more and more within our lives. Give us strength by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we come on now to our, our closing praise, which reflects how all that we do is a response to the love that God has first shown to us. As we sing together, My Jesus, I love thee. share these words together the benediction may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all forevermore amen